to share some thoughts on a very important thing that uh, concerns you and me also, as well as the Italian family. Uh, today, we just want to take a look at the whole concept of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, I'm sure, as uh, Andy told you guys, uh, you have given you a preview of what it's all about. This year actually uh, marks a very important milestone in the declaration itself because uh, 40 years, I mean, 1948, this declaration was already adopted by the entire uh, United Nations involving the entire, the entire countries all over the world. And where we are concerned as John, okay, sorry, I, I didn't use that by this of open instructions. I didn't use my analyst. And uh, Kenny, when they are, the all of us belong to the Center for Media and Peace Initiative. We are here in New York, and uh, essentially what we do in the Center is to promote is to promote a conflict resolving media practice around the world. And issues budgeting on journalism training, journalism practice are very dear to us. And as potential journalists, we think it's important to really have to incorporate some rudiments of journalism practice early enough in some young people who will, go, will be able to transform this profession to a better uh, profession tomorrow. Because the truth about the matter is, most people think that journalism is probably not going the right way. Some basic tenets, some basic central mission of journalism somehow are not really there. And we think that the best way to effect change in some of uh, the areas we think uh, I want, I will come one in should be by getting the younger ones, like more like catching them young, early enough to be able to put you in the right path. So it's part of this program that we're going to various high schools to really share ideas with them, know what are their concerns, what are their potentials and drawings, and we hope that in the future it will be very beneficial for them. So at the end of this presentation, I would like to maybe take some questions on issues that bother you in the profession so as to see areas you know we can contribute and improve your uh, practice. So basically, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, like I told you, was adopted in 1948 by the United Nations. And the area that actually concerns us is the Article 19. You know, the, the, the Declaration has a lot of things that bother on human rights, various rights of individuals, nations, and all that. But as potential journal, the area that I think she was telling me is the Article 19. Article 19 talks about freedom of expression. And I, I like to quote, you know, copiously from the, the Article 19 itself. Article 19 says that everyone, everyone all over the world has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes the right to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So basically, what this thing is talking about is that I and you and everybody, every person in this world has a right to express himself. Much as in the US, for example, there is some basic elements of compliance to this basic freedom. But I'm not sure you know that there are many areas in the world that don't comply to this area because somehow, are, like you can say anything you want, for example, nobody challenges, you can challenge President Bush and say, look, you're not doing well. But there are countries I know, I think to a particular country where, for example, you cannot publish anything in this paper without the approval of government. So some of these areas are areas that I think, you know, do not comply to this basic declaration. And it's not that some of these countries are signatories to this declaration. So much as we also have these basic rights here in the United States and some other parts of the world. And I also want to also share some thoughts in the area of oh, talk about freedom and responsibility. Because much as you have that freedom, you cannot use this freedom recklessly. Like, you may have an experimental newspaper in, uh, in, in this college, but you cannot just publish anything just because you have the freedom to do that. 
you cannot begin to uh, kind of uh, insult or not uh, align your teachers or any of the students just because you have the freedom, you have been told you have the freedom to write whatever you want to write. So in other words, there is a limit to every freedom. There is no absolute freedom. So most freedom are related. And in one way or the other, you gotta be responsible for whatever you say as a reporter. And that calls for you know basic social responsibility. And I do think that maybe as we progress in your journalism practice, you begin to hear things like social responsibility theory of the press. So that will encourage you to be mindful of whatever you write and considering the environment and whoever you're talking to. So, and uh, like uh, I also told you about this uh, article 19, which is critical. I also want to, you know, get some questions, you know, from you people on that, what it means to you as I have read it, and how you think it should be really implemented in the school, outside the school, and wherever. So, and let me also sit up about freedom. You discovered that even before the adoption of this declaration in 1948, about 58 countries were in attendance to adopt this declaration in Paris, in France. But unfortunately, just to demonstrate why there will always be like opposition to various causes like during the school, like say democracy, the majority may have their way, but minorities must have their say. So everybody did not sign on to this declaration. 58 countries gathered, 48 out of these 58 signed this declaration. So eight of them abstained. Especially, and they, you know, like some of you, you may have heard about the Soviet Republic, the Union of Socialist Soviet Republic, the Soviet Union. So obviously they opposed it, and some of those republics around there, because of the communist environment that dominated the era at that particular time. So there are some other countries that did not sign. But a whole lot of other countries signed and it was adopted. So why I have brought out this point is because there will always be room for opposition for a democratic process to be really and truly democratic. There has to be an opportunity where there has to be pluralism. There has to be you know, an ability to be able to hear alternative voices. So if you stay here as a product, Always believe that the other person should give the other person an opportunity to be heard. You know, much as you are the editor of a newspaper, does not give you the ultimate uh, power to determine everything or to kill anybody or to say whatever I want to say. You must also consider the fact that other persons must have their own say. Just like they also say in law that one of the kind of persons of fair justice is, you know, Listen to the other person. Because even God himself, before God condemned Adam, he gave Adam an opportunity to be able to respond to his charges. So at the same time, as a doctor, you must also consider this thing in whatever you intend to write. So that's about that. And talking about uh, this opposition itself, it brings us back into a lot of things that are going on even in this country right now. Whereby sometimes uh, some authorities think that opposition to their policies means dissent or being you know, unpatriotic. So and we reject that kind of notion because in a democracy people should say their mind. And in the process, you know, because in the context of ideas, good innovations, good policies emerge. It is a situation where we live perhaps in a country where we cannot express our views and our rights, it becomes questionable whether we adopt two democratic values. So it is critical that we get to know this. So, and I also would like to go through, because I'm trying to really, you know, I will leave this topic for for a teacher, maybe you may come with that too. I also want to look at some basic concepts about, um, some basic principles about uh, freedom, articulated by an organization called Article 19, it's based in London. So the human rights organization with a state mandate and focus on the threats and promotion of freedom of expression and freedom of information worldwide has drafted the following principle of question underpinning any legislation on freedom of information. So the first principle is maximum disclosure. 
a lot of information and education should be gathered by the principle of maximum disclosure. I believe that as journalists we want to know following some trends. Trends, if you remember sometime last year, two years ago, a reporter was kind of in fact jailed for uh, not disclosing a source of information about a CIA operative that was out in sort of that uh, you know her identity was disclosed and there was an inquiry to find out who actually disclosed this to which is contrary to the law of the land. So if you follow the trend then you would have seen some challenges that really confront today's media practitioner, today's news professional. So and it borders on this uh, maximum disclosure, which of course some registration is being changed to be able to take care of some of these uh, things that probably may not have experienced in the past. So and the obligation to publish is the second principle. How body should be under an obligation to publish key information? And thirdly, there should be a promotion of the open government. Open government talks about public bodies must actively promote open government. Like on the like us, we are interested in promoting open government. And open government is all about transparency. It's all about avoiding things that, like when you want to enact a legislation, you should go through the process, embracing due process, and so on. So I think I must point at this point, maybe it's because uh, when I discuss this, I like to make it interactive. So I have a couple of other principles, but I don't want a situation where you know, it will be coming up from me. So I want so for let us digest and look at whether I'm able to you know appreciate or I mean how people have been talking about and have some of your concerns and issues that you want to raise. Because you must be able to, you know, stick to the time we have to be able to discuss it. Other questions? So far. Questions about the literature? As far as, as far as you 
human rights are concerned. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just like here, yeah, Shirai said, human rights are the rights you every, every one of us is born with. And that's why I said it's God given rights. First of all, the right to life. No person has the right to terminate their life or you have no right to terminate any other person's life whatsoever, no matter what. Well, it goes to the argument about, you know, the, the capital punishment, you know, like uh, execution. Yeah? execution. Execution and all that. But, you know, I, for me to delve into that, I'll get into a little bit of interviews about law and all that. But basically, human rights are God given rights. First of all, the right to life. You know, like the project, freedom of expression. You know, we have this right to be able to say whatever we want to say, you know, but with the caveat, <laughs> some responsibility. So there is a, a, a right freedom of association, freedom of religion. In other words, you are allowed to profess whatever religion you want. Eh? All those issues. These are basic rights. So apparently, so it's not human rights are uh, all the rights that we are given when we are born. You have the right to choose where you want to stay. You, want, you, want, you have the right to choose any group you want to join. And things like that. So these are human rights. Now, going back to the question he has asked, how does the media treat human rights issues? Basically, I think the media treats human rights issues with passion knowing that they are the last line of defense for the ordinary person, the last line of defense for human rights. So that is why human rights basically is a very topical issue for the media and some of us who are in the activist you know, sector. So if you look at it, the media takes it very seriously when it concerns maybe putting someone in jail when the person is supposed to be in jail. It takes your state, like when you watch on television, for example, a child is abducted, a child is kidnapped, or some of these pedophiles and all that. So it takes it very seriously. These are human no rights. Or when uh, there is an unwarranted attack on freedom of expression, either freedom to write or freedom to uh, communicate or something. But the law that guarantees these basic freedoms in a way, conspires to also take part of this freedom away from us. The issues of libel, sedition, and all that. You know what I, you know what I mean by libel? Libel? Libel. Yeah. yeah. You know what it is? You know what's called slander? Slander. Slander, yeah. yeah. Okay, basically, these are defamation laws. They must have talked about that. Okay. In other words, some of these things, in a way, takes away some of these basic rights we do have. Because as if mean, there was a limited freedom to say or publish whatever you like to publish, then I should say you are a, a thief when I try to do it and I should get away with it, right? But because I cannot just say something I cannot substantiate, I cannot, for example, accuse you for whatever I know it's wrong and you did not do. So, you see how it is? Or I cannot even attack President Bush maliciously. Because there's a kind of attack I will you know, unleash on him as a, a reporter, it could be regarded as sedition because I will be inciting the people to remove a government through unlawful means. So, it's, it, I, you know this distinction between sedition, libel, and slander, right? So, basically, so that's how I will approach uh, the matter when I look at how the media treats human rights. I think they treat it seriously and in concert with the judicial arm of the government, don't forget as for the state of the realm, we are also trying to you know coordinate the other you know uh, sectors of government, the judiciary, the judiciary and the executive. So I also think that in treating human rights issues, we also create a conscious approach to make sure other arms are doing their jobs very efficiently. More comments? Yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good. Uh, you guys know about the uh, the ongoing case in Texas with the polygamy sex. Polygamists, they raise all the children out of that Texas sex. sect. You didn't know that? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Polygamy is when one guy marries a, a several women. It was on TV about, about two weeks ago. When the, 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 the authority went into the right and took all the kids.
kids, about 400 and something kids. Did you see that on TV? Sorry. Yeah, they took them out, they spread the kids out amongst foster homes and they're having trouble getting them Right. Back. Looks like sort of a cult. They were wearing long dresses and stuff like that. You know? Okay. You might have seen pictures of that. Okay, what I'm trying to say about that is that, okay, no matter, it is the responsibility of the government to make sure that nobody, that when it comes to child abuse, right, it's the responsibility of the government to protect the kids and prosecute whoever is responsible for that, right? And also, it is also the responsibility of the government to make sure that they don't kind of intrigue into private families. Take for instance, the yeah. mother has a kid, right? And the government cannot just get into the house, grab the kid, and leave. If the government feels that the child is being abused, there's going to be evidence to, to prove that. Because the mother has the right to be with the kid, the government has the right to protect the kid. In Texas, what happens is that, for, for those of you that didn't hear that, someone called from this vulgarity to sex, right? That the kids are being abused. They are being married out to older men before 18, right? So the government just went in there, grabbed all the kids, like 400 or something kids. Okay. You get? And then left. Now, the judgment came yesterday, okay? And the judges were like, the government did not have, the government will have not been able to prove. First of all, they didn't know who made that call. The people from the branch said it was a hoax. Nobody, nothing, there had nobody made any call. Right? So the government now was found like they did the wrong thing. Right? In as much as it's their responsibility to protect the kids, you need to have evidence that they kind of uh, they I'm went against the body. human rights of the both the Hello? mother and the kid. Okay, so Hello? now just like what he was there saying, that the government is liable. Of course, you know what's going to happen after what after uh, yesterday, the lawsuits and whatever. Okay, so to touch on what he's saying, you, the government has no right to get into your home and do whatever they want to do. You have the right as a child to live with your mother. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Yeah, I think uh, one important thing you have reminded me is the whole concept of invasion of privacy. You know, I'm sure maybe Adam he must have told about that, or maybe later I get into that. The whole concept, like uh, what's now rights, you know, you have the right to be left alone. You understand what I'm saying? I cannot just you know, get into your private life and begin to, you know, uh, poke into your private life without permission. But at the same time, I must always provide this caveat. Much as the law says it should not be your rights should be protected or you should not invade your privacy. But if you become a public figure, you know what I mean by being a public figure? Like if you become like a politician, a very popular politician. Like a you know what I mean? There are some you, you, you see that way some of these basic rights. Because you're not a public prophecy. So you cannot say it because uh, you're plenty that should not know how your your bed looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that I should not know how Maybe uh, people would be interested in knowing even what kind of food does this guy eat? Is he really a human being or what is happening to John McCain? Is he, does he, you know, like nobody would worry about, about my age, whether I'm good or not. You know? Nobody would worry about it. But you see some of this system being reported because, you know, he's a uh, public figure. Or you're talking about the Bush or what is his name? Even Obama or something. Uh, or even, uh, I think it's the more popular. Celebrities. Uh -huh, exactly. What's going on with Beyonce, right? Uh -huh. Okay, what well, kind of restaurant she goes, she goes to, what's going on, uh, uh, is she pregnant? Uh -huh. Something like that. As, as an individual, you're not a celebrity. Nobody has the right to ask you that kind of question. But if you're a public figure, people will start asking that kind of question. And you can't shy away from that, you have to answer it because you're up there. Uh, on the podium, everybody wants to know what's going on in your bedroom, and you don't ask them. Britney Spears is always right away from the apparatus, right. you know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so that is how this is how this is. Uh, so, so it's important that I just brought that out about you know invading one's privacy and stuff. So, are there other species you want us to talk about? Questions? 
But what you just talked about, we've talked about in the past how newspapers nowadays, a lot of the stories are about celebrities instead of important issues that affect, you know, more people. Okay. So that we read, you know, Beyonce's on the cover. Yes. Or Britney Spears is on the cover. Yeah. Because she drank too much and got into a car accident. Uh, you know, instead of, you know, things that are happening, atrocities around the world and things like that, you know. Uh, so what's happened with the media is they want to sell newspapers, and they sort of want to just keep us happy and not think about uh, bad stuff that's going on around the world. So we read about Britney Spears, and we read about who won American Idol, and that kind of stuff, where you know there are people dying of starvation, and there are in Myanmar. The government won't let uh, you know they're, they're letting aid come in now, but. The big cyclones that killed like uh, that say like a hundred thousand people. Yeah. And that's crazy. If you were to take uh, what stadium fits a hundred thousand people? Not Giants. I think Giants Stadium seats seventy like five thousand. If you've ever been in a large stadium, put everybody in a seat in that in that stadium, and what you have is the amount of people who are dying in Myanmar, or even in the China earthquake and stuff like that. You know? But what do we have on the cover of our newspapers? <laughs> Let's see. Here's today's. Oh, yeah. Help find my hero. All right, guy did a nice thing. He saved somebody from drowning right there. And uh, let's see. Clock's ticking on Willie's job. Clock ticking on Willie's job. Anybody know who that is? Willie Randolph. Willie Randolph, that's right. So on the front page of a newspaper with uh, thousands of people dying around the world, we've got whether a baseball manager is going to be fired or not. That's the daily news. But look, I have these papers, so I like them. I like to read them also, you know. <laughs> what do we have? Oh my god, I am man in vice. Yeah, oh my god. <laughs> now, it's put sort of like a funny, comical way, but uh, actually this is a little bit more serious. It's about, you know, the presidential campaign, and uh, anybody know what vice means? Yeah, uh, something wrong about that. Uh, yes, but what does it mean here? Vice is like prostitution, gambling. Well, what does it mean here? What? No. Wait, the uh, vice president. Vice president. Yeah. vice president. yeah. And also, there's a reason the post uses that word. They also, you know, they want sex in there and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, uh, thank you, Benji. I going back to what you have just said. You know, let's just uh, wrap up. You see, like what you have said, this this is one of the problems we are really having in the day. So we are concerned that. The media has really developed its central mission in society. In other words, the media now tells the audience what they want to hear and not what they need to hear. Does that make sense? Yes. Can you yeah. explain what it is? There's a difference between what you want and what you need to have. So, like the writer pointed out, apparently because at that time, so the media is kind of following the trend of society in terms of what they want to do, and these things are propelled also by economic interests. But to run a newspaper is very expensive. So if you concentrate on running, focusing on the central mission of journalism, others will go on all these trapalities and all these you know, mundane issues to attract listeners or, or readers, and in the process of making more money. 